Yevgeny, you should start the recording. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. We are starting the 15th academic workshop of the social protection as a part of anti-crisis support package cycle. Before we begin, let me make several housekeeping remarks. I would like to ask everybody to mute your mics when you're not speaking. We are recording this workshop. So please keep your mic muted unless you're speaking at the moment. Also, I would encourage everyone to check out your names. They should be exactly the way that you have signed up for the conference. We have simultaneous interpretation at this event, so I would ask everybody to uh, speak clearly into the mic. And if you have a headset, it is strongly recommended to use it. That improves the quality of the sound. At the bottom of the screen, in the instrument panel, you have a little globe button. If you want to listen to the presentations in either English or Russian, you should select one of these languages. Then you are going to hear either one of these two languages. And the last remark is for the presenters. Please don't speak too fast. We have simultaneous interpretation and uh, to make sure that the quality is high, don't rush it. And now I would like to pass the floor over uh, to Lilia Ovcharova, Vice Rector of the Higher School of Economics. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am very happy to welcome all of you at this wonderful workshop that Oksana Sinyavskaya is in charge of. Today, in my introductory remarks, I would like to say that this workshop, Active Aging Policy and Pension Reforms, Russian and International Experience, like several other activities uh, that Higher School of Economics has launched, they have been included in the Center of Studies of Human Capital. This is a research center of world level. It is based on four organizations, Higher School of Economics, uh, RENEPA, the Institute of Foreign Relations and Academic Institute for Anthropology and Ethnography. Uh, to be more precise, uh, Ethnography and uh, Anthropology. There have been a lot of people who have uh, submitted applications uh, to this center, and I want to congratulate uh, all those who made it. This is a rare event. When we look at various uh, scientific activities of world class, usually that uh, would be in the field of natural sciences. And this is the first time in 25 years that uh, several organizations have received a grant uh, to do social studies. Uh, my congratulations to Oksana, who is acting as a moderator of this workshop. You have one in our internal uh, contest and uh, you have become a part of a world-class research center. I also want uh, to uh, share this good news with our colleagues from the World Bank. Now we at the Higher School of Economics act uh, together uh, with the uh, world-class center called Center for Interdisciplinary Studies of Human Potential. We are looking at uh, a broad subject of active aging policy. We believe that this is the subject that uh, we have to think about 
once we come into this world. Today, we are going to speak about anti-crisis support packages uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not going to talk about it because this is uh, the subject that will be covered at length. I just want to welcome all participants at this event. We uh, at the Higher School of Economics and our partners in the Interdisciplinary Studies Center believe that this uh, is an event of the world-class center of studies. And now I'm going to pass the floor to Nadine, who is going to uh, make some introductory remarks on behalf of the World Bank, the co-organizer of this workshop. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, I'm happy to welcome you at this workshop organized by the World Bank and by the Higher School of Economics. Thank you very much to my colleagues from Higher School of Economics for organizing such very useful and very interesting discussions. Today, we are here to talk about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on social policies and on economic development in the world. Uh, in real time, we are witnessing different countries introducing different uh, support packages uh, to find the consequences of the pandemic and to improve the living standards. We can compare and evaluate uh, these measures. We can see how their approaches uh, to social assistance are changing in such conditions. When we do this analysis, uh, we raise two main questions uh, that all countries face, Russia included. It's very important to understand uh, whether the measures that have been undertaken are adequate. Are there any gaps uh, in support measures? Today, in the mass media and in various uh, surveys, we see indications of people's unhappiness. We see that uh, the poverty level is growing. Even the president of Russian Federation paid attention to this difficult situation. He uh, said that it's important uh, to make sure that people have enough money for food. We are witnessing this pandemic and we see that such situation can last for quite some time. And uh, in this context, it's very important uh, to develop social assistance uh, systems, assuming uh, that uh, this uh, pandemic is going to be with us for some time, uh, whether the uh, social support system was initially attuned uh, to offer immediate support or not. The government should develop an ability to offer additional uh, support packages when the situation demands that. Or maybe there is an entirely a new need for a new program that can react in a counter-cyclical fashion uh, to the latest developments. We're going to have two presentations in this session. They will launch the discussion of very interesting matters. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nitin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mrs. Ovcharova. Yes, indeed, this is a great news, very important news. That is the launch of the new research center uh, where Higher School of Economics is going to act as one of the participants. Today, we are going to talk about uh, the main uh, event of this year and uh, we are sort of drawing conclusions of 2020, organizing this academic workshop. We are going to talk about the pandemic and the challenges that the support programs are facing. Active aging a theme uh, that uh, we are also uh, reviewing during this series of workshops is also very relevant for people of different ages. We're going to talk about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, impact uh, on people's well-being 
uh, we are going to look at different age groups. What kind of social assistance measures have been offered? Uh, we will look at different studies. Before I pass the floor to our presenter, uh, to Ugo, I want uh, to say this one thing. During this year, we have more than once looked at the social consequences of the pandemic. We try to forecast uh, the responses in different parts of Russia. We have looked at uh, different response measures. We have seen at the challenges that the population uh, has faced. We have talked about it at uh, our joint events with the World Bank and with MIFI uh, University. We have looked at uh, elimination or reduction of poverty and inequality. We have looked at other aspects of the pandemic impact like uh, social insurance uh, system development uh, and uh, long-term care system situation. Today, both presentations focus on what has been achieved uh, during this year, what uh, we have seen during two waves of the pandemic, and uh, we can now identify some long-term challenges uh, for social policies. There is no doubt uh, that uh, the pandemic is a much more serious challenge for sustainable development. It's uh, not only impacting poverty or inequality situations, which are on the surface. Uh, there is one very interesting observation that very many experts have written about. It uh, is that uh, during the pandemic, uh, we can very clearly, more clearly than during the uh, world economic crisis of 2008, uh, we have seen a special role of social policies and the role of governments as anti-crisis managers. In the past, uh, social policies have been viewed uh, as uh, a general tool. Now, at the time of the pandemic, we see that social policy acts as a macroeconomic uh, stabilizing uh, factor uh, that saves the economy and protects people. Very many countries are increasing uh, their spendings at the second wave uh, of the pandemic uh, to stimulate economic growth. The pandemic is different from all previous crises. Today, uh, Ugo is going to talk about social assistance measures uh, that have been launched by countries with very different levels of economic development. Richer countries, welfare countries like Russia uh, can use their existing uh, stimulus packages. They can add things, but countries with lower level of economic development also launch uh, social protection uh, programs uh, to protect people in today's situation. And we still see an open question. What kind of social protection uh, policies we are going to see after the pandemic? What are the challenges that we are going to uh, address later? What are the tools available to us now? Uh, is the pandemic going to be the starting point for the new approach to social protection? Uh, can the pandemic uh, become a catalyst for new types of social protection? Today, we are going to talk about the general international framework. And uh, I am very happy to introduce to you Ugo Gentilini, uh, who is the global lead for social assistance with the social protection and jobs uh, global practice at the World Bank. He knows very well what happens in the field of social protection at the time of the pandemic. He knows more about it than anyone else out there. And then we're going to focus on the Russian uh, measures and the response of the Russian population uh, to the programs launched by the government. Uh, Alina Pishnak is going to make a presentation on that. Uh, she is... Uh, with the Center of Studies of Income and Living Standards. Ugo, over to you at this point. You have 30 minutes. Thank you, thank you so much. I will uh, start by trying to share my, my screen. 
which hopefully would work. Uh, just a second. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, to the Higher School of Economics. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be with you today. I'm really thrilled to participate in this event. I look forward to share some of the emerging findings that we are collecting from uh, cross-country experiences, but also very much look forward to, to learn uh, from you on uh, the Russia experience, as well as any thought that you may have um, on, on other countries as well. Um, my, my talk's gonna largely draw from uh, a, um, a paper that we have been um, updating uh, almost on a monthly basis uh, uh, since uh, March. We are at version 14 um, and we call it the living paper just because there is so much that is happening and from one month to the other, there are such remarkable changes that in a way we are still in the middle of it. And uh, uh, some emerging lessons are coming up, um, but um, um, there is, uh, I think the evidence based on how effective and efficient measures are is still, in, uh, is still somewhat preliminary. Um, but um, as uh, Oksana, you said earlier, there is a core set of lessons that we can start derive from those early experiences. In a way, I also fully agree with you, Oksana, that the response is being in many ways unprecedented. Um, uh, but there are also questions, is it, uh, it, it is unprecedented, but is it enough? And, uh, and Nitin said uh, it's important to see whether uh, measures were adequate. That's exactly one of the questions that I'm gonna try to tackle by offering an overview of the trends as we see them in different countries and some of the reflections based on them. So before, before starting and getting into COVID, maybe I just have a couple of slides uh, to show where we are coming from and um, um, how, did, um, how was the world as we knew it before, before COVID. And this is a graph that shows uh, social assistance uh, coverage in, uh, in uh, different country income groups. And, uh, and you see that obviously there is a strong pattern by income, but uh, as Oksana said at the beginning, low income countries um, tend, to be, tend to show limited coverage. Uh, less than one fifth of the population receives uh, um, any sort of um, uh, social protection and social assistance program um, there is very little social insurance. So the social protection is largely equal to social assistance in those contexts. There is an average of spending of 1.5% of GDP, a level that's been dwarfed now by the COVID response, but that was a level to start with. And transfers in general, when we think of uh, uh, how much people are getting and all the debates all around labor disincentives, uh, they tend to be pretty modest. Uh, it's about one fourth of the income or consumption of the poorest segments of the population. So transfers tend to be generally modest. And social assistance is also quite diverse. There are so many programs that, uh, that all together form that, uh, the group that I just thought to share this cube um, uh, through which you could see how different programs uh, um, how they look like based on uh, their targeting, uh, based on whether transfers come with some sort of co-responsibility or conditionality, or what kind of modality they're provided uh, in like in cash, in vouchers, or in kind. And it's interesting to see that there is all this variety, but for COVID, uh, programs have often been simplified, and what you see out there is basically this set of vertical cubes with universal basic income with social pensions and unconditional cash transfers uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, have uh, 
instead um, that have formed the bulk of the response. We haven't seen much on public works, on conditional trans uh, transfers, and other forms that normally constitute the universe of social assistance. Um, the expansion that I'm going to talk about also has been uh, uh, coming uh, and built up over time. Um, we have seen worldwide that already in the early 2000s, um, uh, the number of programs that were introduced has increased uh, steadily. In Africa, which is the graph to the right, uh, there has been an average of 14 programs per year introduced between 2010 and 2015. Um, and part of the reason why we, we have seen this uh, momentum building up has been uh, um, uh, a very extensive empirical agenda that developed uh, in particular around uh, cash transfers. Um, I counted 54 systematic reviews of, of systematic reviews. Um, there, there are over 10,000 studies uh, uh, published since 2000. And uh, this is just a general framework looking at uh, um, the, the dimensions across human capital, resilience, and economic inclusion that the literature has covered for programs designed in, in different ways. But the point being that the evidence is quite convincing on these programs and did play a major role uh, the moment in which government were um, uh, pondering the choices on what to do. So on one hand, you had all this implementation infrastructure, on the other, you had evidence. And, and then the, the COVID uh, crisis came and uh, um, Oksana referred to it earlier, um, the level of overall stimulus that governments are putting into economies is uh, more than double than what we have seen uh, a decade ago in the Great Recession. Um, and a fair share of those uh, um, nearly, um, it's equivalent to a little more than 12 trillion, um, about 800 billion or, or for social protection. So it's, that's almost 20% more than, in, than a decade ago, and we're just at the beginning of, uh, of the crisis. Um, we have um, um, seen uh, a number of uh, measures being put in place since, uh, since March. Um, over almost a little over 1,400 in basically every country and every territory worldwide. I mentioned how fluid the situation is. There has been a 20% increase uh, in the measures just uh, uh, last week compared to September. So again, the situation is, is still very fluid. Um, most of the measures are uh, providing the form of social assistance um, over 60%. And um, cash transfers uh, um, represent about 30, 33% of the overall package. Um, there is a lot of different programs also um, within those broad buckets of social assistance, social insurance, and labor markets. Um, again, cash transfers mostly provided unconditionally. Social pensions, school feeding programs have also uh, operated in quite some interesting ways uh, with food being delivered uh, directly to people's uh, doorsteps uh, uh, and a range of utility exemptions and waivers uh, for uh, water bills, electricity bills, um, even rent, rental support, a range of interesting, uh, interesting programs, a little less on, on public works, as you can see, only 22 measures. Um, on social insurance, also, there are at least four broad categories that we have here, paid sick leave, um, social security contribution waivers, unemployment benefits, uh, also a lot of action on pensions as well as uh, health care insurance. And waste subsidies also play a very important role. Um, governments has, have been stepping in decisively in that area of active labor market policies. We see training also are, are coming up as well as other measures. So it's not just social assistance, but social assistance does play a major role. Uh, but um, it's important to mention that uh, measures are short term. Um, on average, 3.3 months. Um, so it's, it's very short term. And out of the 429 cash transfer programs, only 
Um, less than 10%, 32 measures have been extended for an average of about 2.8 months. In other words, come the end of the year, a number of these measures uh, are going to come to an end. And uh, there are countries that have been, again, a few of them in 32 cases being extend, extended those measures. Uh, but there is a lot of uncertainty on, on the future of, uh, of those schemes. If we look at how, um, how systems have been adapted, um, uh, it's quite intriguing to note that uh, um, when we look at what is so-called horizontal expansion, basically coverage increase, um, only a few countries have extended their schemes, the pre-existing ones. Um, about 63% of cash transfer programs out there are new programs. Um, and about a third of them are one-off schemes. Um, uh, so it's, uh, that is also an indication that the, 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 the sort of large scale um, coverage of programs um, and countries uh, attempt to, to reach um, populations uh, that weren't previously covered by social assistance meant that the existing systems weren't really fit for purpose and new schemes had to be put in place to augment those capacities. But at the same time, we see also a number of administrative innovations. Um, uh, programs have been made easier, um, have, um, um, uh, I think there is a range of uh, um, uh, application processes and, uh, and remote uh, uh, registration that probably that weren't in place before and that probably going to stay on even after, after the crisis. Um, <laughs> countries have also increased their uh, benefit levels substantially. Um, a number of countries have gone through all these measures uh, together. So more benefits, more coverage, um, uh, more nimble administration. And we have country examples of all of them. Um, here I'm just uh, giving you a sense of, uh, of some of the top 10 performers in terms of uh, coverage uh, um, increases, uh, coverage of the population, as well as in absolute uh, numbers. And uh, you see that in a few cases, countries opted to just cover the entire population. Um, uh, in some cases, just the adult population, in others, all the population. So that's why you see the kind of top tier <laughs> cases that are either 100% uh, or, or nearly so, um, but also the kind of numbers are, are quite impressive. Uh, the US is nearly 160 million, Russia, Russia is also in the top 10, um, but we see also really middle income countries like the Philippines, uh, uh, like Indonesia, or, or even Myanmar that uh, really have uh, ramped up their, their schemes quite, uh, quite remarkably. Let me also, underscore that uh, um, perhaps I should have included <laughs> an interesting graph that, uh, that really displays that uh, 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 the countries that have higher poverty rates uh, are those also with uh, the least coverage. So there has been a lot of increases, but you could clearly see that countries that um, have better infrastructure, as I'll show later, uh, did the, were able to, to, to scale up more. But in relative terms, if we look at what countries did have in place before COVID, what they have now, um, we see an increase in benefit that is almost doubled on average, and uh, a, about a 240% increase uh, 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 relative to pre-COVID levels in coverage. So you see also some of the, the top countries out there, Congo, just because they had such low levels to start with, um, then you, you see those rates being particularly high. Uh, but overall, I think this really signals the level of, uh, of effort that has been put into it. Um, in terms of implementation, implementation progress, we were able for 82 programs to go back and look at the, um, what were the commitments and what were the actual uh, numbers um, how many of the stated uh, uh, beneficiaries uh, or planned beneficiaries were actually reached with transfers. And we see that actually uh, for these programs for which there is information, 
the, the situation is quite uh, promising with uh, the difference between planned and actual uh, coverage numbers being only 2.3 percentage points. So um, uh, progress, implementation progress is, is quite positive. And um, countries, uh, here I'm showing a couple of indicators, um, countries that uh, do have um, uh, better infrastructure um, the JAM index is an index that combine identification, bank accounts, and mobile phones. You, you see, therefore, some of the um, East Asia countries, um, the coverage versus uh, the infrastructure, and the same for social registries, uh, basically countries that have lists of beneficiaries that they can tap. Um, so those tend to, those that have uh, um, higher coverage of those registries tend also to be the countries that have uh, higher coverage in cash transfers. Um, we see a number of innovations in, um, um, in uh, uh, delivery. Um, I mentioned those registries, but oftentimes the effort has been to reach informal sector workers that were neither eligible to social assistance nor to social insurance. That is often referred to as the middle. And to reach those, uh, those workers, uh, a number of uh, uh, creative uh, um, uh, creative ways have been uh, 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 and arrangements have been devised by by countries. Um, here is just uh, here are just a few a few examples. Um, but uh, cross checks with uh, different uh, databases is uh, um, has been a constant uh, um, a constant feature across countries. Uh, uh, Morocco, for example, comes to mind that tapped the um, a health insurance fee waivers database and, and combine it with the social assistance one. Uh, uh, Colombia did something something similar. And um, equally for um, for payments, uh, a lot of variety in uh, in approaches. Uh, um, uh, even countries, and I'm not reporting it here, but uh, countries like uh, uh, Madagascar uh, have. Uh, provided uh, an array of different options to the populations uh, based on various parts of the countries from the more higher tech to, to the more basic payment modalities. So we, we have seen really an explosion of those sort of practices. And uh, it's, it, it's quite uh, also fascinating to note uh, that uh, a number of those uh, informal sector workers that I mentioned uh, tend to be located in urban areas and there has been a, uh, um, uh, the, a, a re-emergence, I think, of interest in uh, how to provide social assistance and insurance in cities. So much of uh, the existing portfolios pre-COVID were located in rural areas um, and working in urban areas uh, does pose uh, um, a range of different challenges in, um, um, in dealing with mobile populations, issues around portability of benefits. There are experiences um, before COVID hit, there are about 15, uh, in, um, over about 15 years, uh, uh, 20 years, there were two dozen countries at least that uh, uh, deliberately adapted the uh, cash transfer programs to cities. And we see now the second generation with COVID um, that has really um, brought up this agenda again uh, uh, and, and moved it center stage. Um, and this has very practical and concrete uh, um, implications on how programs are implemented. Um, we see countries like uh, uh, Congo uh, or uh, Kinshasa in, in particular where par new partnerships were set up with uh, mobile phone companies uh, um, a new satellite images used for, for targeting with granular data down at street level. Um, so urban areas have opened up, I think, uh, a range of uh, interesting questions that were there, um, but also a number of uh, different challenges on how to combine assistance with long-term uh, challenges in, uh, in youth unemployment uh, and other challenges. Um, very quickly on financing, um, uh, yes, there are 800 billion invested at the moment, but when you look in particular at uh, some of the lower income countries, the per capita dollars are, are, 
quite low. Uh, we estimate about $6 per capita. So this is not per month, so it's in absolute terms, $6 per capita and 176 uh, on average um, in, different, uh, in different contexts. Uh, this is another illustration on how, how they vary by, by different uh, country income groups, which uh, does raise the, the question of, uh, is it really adequate, <laughs> the level of support that we see at the moment uh, going into different countries? Um, an interesting question is also, where is the money coming from? Um, how are countries paying for this uh, initial waves of, uh, of support? Um, it's, a, it, it's a basic question, but it's surprising how little evidence there is out there. Um, we we uh, did a, uh, a stock taking of 31 countries. Uh, here you see some, uh, some of the results. Um, we have a much larger work program coming up um uh on on um, um estimating how countries are paying and uh, and uh, for for those schemes and uh, having case studies on how the sources and the composition of financing evolved over time uh, but the point here is that uh, there has been a lot of spending reallocation I, ukraine comes to mind where some of the money that was meant to be for the census i think was reallocated uh, for part of the support um, uh, for social protection, uh, a, a lot of debt uh, and, uh, and deficit uh, financing as well, which raises the issue of financial sustainability. So I'm almost to the end. This is my second last slide. Um, I spoke about government responses, but there is also a lot of humanitarian assistance that goes into countries that uh, isn't really channeled through government structures. Um, out of the nearly $30 billion of humanitarian assistance, only about 1% of that is channeled via government structures. So there is a whole, uh, especially in the lower income country uh, segment, uh, there is a lot of assistance that is uh, channeled directly from donors to implementation agencies uh, that uh, isn't really accounted for. Um, so probably what I showed you is uh, a conservative estimate of what's going on on the ground. Um, finally, some some my this is my last slide with the ref, with uh, some uh, some reflections. I'd love to you know discuss more with you on on them. Um, again, this is this didn't really occur by accident. It's the result of uh, long term investments in the uh, implementation capabilities and evidence uh, generation. Um, and uh, I think there has been also a lot of interest. Uh, on uh, how to how to universalize uh, social protection what are the best ways of getting there and i think the discussion uh, uh around the pandemic is accelerating those sort of conversations that were pre-existing just because of the large coverage that we see at the moment uh, we see a number of different ways in which uh, assistance and insurance are interacting uh, the same for uh, social assistance and, and labor markets uh, a number of cash transfers are being given as uh, uh, in, in the form of childcare support. So really highlighting the linkages between, between the two. Um, uh, as mentioned, countries have only in part tapped their existing systems. They have also relied extensively of new, on new programs, often on a short-term basis. And there is an open question the extent to which those will remain and the extent to which they will be institutionalized and in part is going to depend i think on the evolution of the COVID, of the pandemic on one hand but also on the political economy of reform on whether those programs are going to take a substitute for some other existing schemes or what would be the actual demand that's going to be expressed for those schemes by those that are currently covered uh, like informal sector workers and uh, fiscal sustainability, again, hasn't, for good reasons, uh, in a number of ways, hasn't been uh, um, a central discussion at the moment because of the pressing needs, but it's going to get there pretty soon. Um, programs were simplified. I think there is a lot of interest on um, whether programs should go back and be more complex as they were, or um, whether they should maintain a more simple design. Um, and I think there's going to be increased scrutiny around kind of the trade-offs between administrative complexity 
extent the effectiveness of programs and their efficiency moving forward. Um, it's whatever the direction uh, I think country is going to get the, the, the point of getting delivery systems universal um, is, is going to be a core tenet of the debate. Uh, um, even high income countries uh, had glitches um, and had delivery bottlenecks that in a number of ways uh, hampered um, uh, delivery. So, but the, the potential for every country to, in principle, reach every single person through uh, solid um, identification mechanisms and payment arrangements uh, is probably going to be up there. And uh, there is a big agenda on how we prepare better for the next one. Um, uh, can uh, a lot of the scale up that I discussed uh, until now is based on, on the policy process. Uh, um, uh, uh, there is uh, some interesting lateral learning that can happen, I think, from the from the climate change uh, uh, world where early warning systems are put in place and that early warning systems uh, have specific triggers for scale up. And uh, I think that's another area where uh, thinking through objective triggers for scale up in the future um, and, and how health-based indicators could feed into that process is, is going to be a fascinating area of work. Uh, I'll stop here and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Uga, uh, for a very interesting presentation and also for a very good time scheduling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ugo was extremely punctual and we have a couple of minutes for questions and answers. One question was written in the chat. I'm going to read it out loud and then we are going to take a couple of verbal questions. This is a question from Sergei Smirnov. If there's been any assessments of the poverty growth when no measures were taken. Do you know of the situation in the countries? Uh, can you share any conclusions? Thank you, Sergei. This is a, an excellent question. We are actually working on it as we speak. Um, uh, we, we hope that um, uh, we, we can come up with, uh, with estimates. Uh, um, uh, the World Bank has been uh, producing uh, poverty estimates uh, based on high frequency surveys. Um, and um, uh, the data was published uh, quite recently. And we are now uh, trying to combine that information with um, our poverty colleagues and, and, and come up with uh, um, estimates of what would have happened in the absence of it. So uh, you're absolutely on spot. Um, um, I will be very happy to share with you the, the results when uh, when they are out. There are there is though a um, I think a long-standing uh, literature on uh, what would what the, what would have happened to poverty and inequality in the absence of uh, of transfers, and uh, I think that's uh, that's a well-established li literature. I'll be very happy to share a number of papers with you. Um, just you know the state of safety nets. Uh, 2018 report uh, by the World Bank also provides uh, a number of interesting data points on uh, on that um, and and the work by I think Nora Lustig and the commitment for equity really shows uh, um, the um, uh, the role that redistribution plays uh, in um, including cash transfers in um, uh, in poverty and inequality. So her work also has been. Uh, um, uh, quite uh, clear in uh, il illustrating that, uh, that point. But uh, uh, I hope by early next year, uh, we can have those estimates uh, and be very happy to share them. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to read a question from uh, Margarita Prakotskaya. And then Marina Gernak is going to ask a question. Can you give us an example of countries that, in your opinion, have created the most successful poverty registries? Uh, well, there are there are quite a few, um, and um, um, I also should say that uh, there is a, uh, a wonderful work that was just published by. 
by colleagues uh, precisely on on uh, on this topic and uh, and on other delivery delivery uh, issues is called the source book uh, on delivery systems uh, it's available online it's a thick 500 page uh, uh, report but uh, countries like brazil um, countries like um, uh, thailand uh, uh, pakistan has um, is now um, also in the process of uh, updating its all uh, large scale social registry. So there is a, the, the issue with registries is that um, uh, a number of countries uh, um, have uh, uh, large coverage in those, uh, with those registries. So a large share of the population is, is there. Uh, the challenge is how frequently the data is uh, updated. So in a number of cases uh, that could be actually you know more than four years old the data in there and uh, what we see now uh, is really a, a shift from uh, administration led data collection to more um, demand led data collection so giving the possibility of people to update themselves their socioeconomic conditions uh, uh, and updating them in in the registry um, and countries again like uh, like Brazil now has uh, has uh, data that is uh, about two years old um, and and not you know um, uh, four or more. But we see that the overall trend is is making these registries more and more dynamic. So if there was a first stage of uh, getting the data in, now it's uh, really about making that. Uh, um, updated and, and dynamic, but I think that uh, Brazil is one of uh, one of those. But there are also um, uh, cases in uh, in uh, in uh, low-income countries that have been fascinating. I've uh, uh, I didn't mention Togo in uh, in my in my presentation, but Togo is uh, kind of an outlier example that shows that uh, uh, sometimes you don't need a social registry. So uh, Togo based its uh, it's scale up on uh, its voter voter ID cards that did include also some information on uh, on uh, economic characteristics uh, or at least uh, uh, employment related characteristics and uh, uh, that was used for for the scale up without the registry per se. So that that's again it's part of uh, the diversity of uh, of approaches that we have seen out there. But uh, um, uh, I would. Uh, re recommend also that uh, yeah the source book on delivery system is uh, is an excellent uh, source for for this kind of uh, comparative uh, um, comparative information including on social registry. Thank you very much. The last question from Marina Girniak. And just simple question. Did you analyze somehow the institutional process of introduction of all these new measures? I mean, it was just like a discussion inside the government and it was mostly the opinion and decisions of policymakers or uh, there were cases when it included wide public consultations like um, surveys or asking people opinions. Uh, what should be done or not, or maybe it's another way to see what other countries do and just copy it. And maybe you have any reflections on this and maybe recommendations. <laughs> I see you smiling. <laughs> no, Maria, I think it's uh, <laughs> you're after a very important uh, point uh, here, and I could see really an interesting uh, research area in in examining these questions. So, um, I think there is a, a gap there on, on the whole uh, policy process. And um, um, there, there has been a tremendous amount of uh, cross-country learning that, um, uh, you know, as, as, as an institution that works across countries, we, we have facilitated a number of those uh, lessons sharing and, uh, and, um, and getting countries in touch and having... Uh, uh, what we call clinics, uh, where countries can learn from each other, uh, often on informal on an informal basis. And I think that I I cannot quantify how important that was, but uh, I think it did play a role. And uh, 
if I think of, uh, I don't want to name it, but there is a Latin American country that uh, looked uh, with some interest of the Moroccan experience. And uh, um, so I, I do see a role for there, for, for this cross-country learning. But uh, um, in terms of um, uh, actual internal process of decision-making, um, I have anecdotes I could think of, uh, um, the leadership role that in some cases, uh, PMs, uh, prime ministers themselves have played and, uh, and, uh, city mayors. Um, so there has been a strong, uh, um, strong role played, uh, uh, and, you know, there are a few countries in Africa that, that come to mind, but, uh, um, I think that's a fascinating question, uh, I think to explore. And um, when I mentioned in my, my last slide on the reflections on how much of uh, this uh, scale ups is based on policy processes, I, I meant exactly that. So um, uh, by how much is the scale up happening to whom for how much time is, is very idiosyncratic. And I think there, is, should, there should always be a role for, for that policy discretion. But at the same time, um, I, I do see the role for also more, in, more objective triggers um, that uh, based on uh, early warning systems are able to activate assistance in the more objective terms. Um, it's very much the insurance principle. And we know, of course, all these issues related to basis risk, uh, but uh, I think uh, there is something there that uh, for for us to be better prepared um, next time, having that information um, directly feeding part of the scale up decisions, I think is going to be important, and we see this happening in the, the sphere of uh, of uh, droughts, for example, in uh, countries even like Ethiopia and Kenya. Uh, do have precisely those systems for early action. So based on how the surveillance system around that risks are evolving, those tend to activate specific measures for, for scale up. And uh, I wonder whether there is scope for that sort of learning and uh, in the health uh, domain and, uh, and better connecting uh, those, uh, those early warning systems with uh, with uh, uh, scale up decisions. I'm, I'm not the only one raising it. Uh, others uh, like Moffitt has been doing that uh, in, in the US, um, including for unemployment insurance. But uh, I think it's, uh, it's an important area and I hope Maria, you're gonna take on this research agenda on uh, uh, and, and the HAC maybe it's, uh, it's gonna do that. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ugo. And now we are going to take the next presentation. It will be a presentation of two parts. Uh, I'm going to do one part and Alina Pishnaka is going to do the other. We're going to talk about the uh, social assistance in Russia at the time of the pandemic. We will look at the situation from two angles. We will see what the government has done and uh, what the reaction of the population was. The first part uh, will be done by myself, and then I will pass it over to Alina. In my part, I am going to uh, focus on what has been done and on the evaluation of the things uh, that uh, have been done, whether they were relevant uh, to the challenges that the pandemic brought about. I'm going to rely on my own research and on the research that was done uh, at uh, different organizations. This was the research that I did together uh, with uh, my colleagues from our school. I would like to mention Yelena Gorina, Natalia Grishenko, Yelena Silisnyova, and Anna Chervikova. 
uh, they helped uh, to uh, draw general conclusions on the first wave of the pandemic. Uh, first of all, I would like uh, to set a theoretical framework. And uh, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, the pandemic is really a unique uh, challenge uh, to social protection mechanisms. There are risks out there that are on the surface and the governments have responded to those risks, uh, threats to uh, people's health and uh, healthcare systems were responding to this challenge. Then uh, governments were willing to protect people's lives and health and they were making different decisions. Uh, some of them, especially in Europe and in the United States included uh, imposing some limitations, social distancing, self-isolation, certain uh, business limitations. Those decisions have caused consequences uh, that were important from standpoint of people's well-being and uh, living standards. If we look at the decisions made by most countries, we see that uh, most of them make decisions in the sphere of healthcare, or they impose limitations to protect people's health. In the way of social protection, uh, they respond uh, to people's losses of jobs. They offer social assistance, social insurance, or offer measures to support employment or benefits for the unemployed. Uh, there are sets of risks that are not uh, limited uh, to only that though. All countries that made decisions on self-isolation and on lockdown uh, faced a number of risks. They had to do with the difficulties of switching to remote learning mode and uh, higher costs of this model of education. Uh, there's uh, more money needed uh, to buy food for all family members. There were also technical challenges uh, that different countries faced. All countries that offered assistance to uh, families with children saw that uh, there was a change in the balance between uh, work and life. We have seen that many parents have seen much higher burden associated with uh, taking care of their children. There were a lot of publications on that, especially during the first wave of the pandemic. Senior citizens uh, face the risk of irregular servicing at home and old people's homes became a source of increased risk of um, contagion and mortality. And this is something which was not associated with the challenges to revenue support system, but social care and medical care and solutions. And insurance, the proper balance of labor and family functions. At the same time, there are several other challenges that social policies pursued by governments can hardly cope with just because they're not associated with economic well-being. We're talking about home violence uh, during the lockdown especially in those countries which suffered the first wave of pandemic the worst and the deteriorated well-being of several social groups and the fact that older people are subject to the risks of more grave illness and also inequality because against the background of the current pandemic inequality became much more pronounced 
Also, various economic groups are um, subject to different risks during the pandemic. They're faced with different challenges, uh, the risks of contracting a disease, and they had different um, opportunities of maintaining their lifestyles and le standard of living during the pandemic. Therefore, there are different components uh, which um, suffered from stress. And as to how the Russian government responded to that, what was the Russian anti-crisis plan? Well, like many other countries, well, there are mainly cash transfers and monetary policy, the reduced rate set by the central bank, which improved the availability of credit resources to households and corporate sector, administrative and monetary support to the business community. And the Russian policy in this context was mainly focused on systemic companies and setting up a list of those industries that suffered the worst from the pandemic. And within that target group, mainly uh, support measures were offered to uh, sole proprietors and small and medium enterprises. I believe that the policy was not very consistent in terms of um, facing the challenges of growing unemployment when it came to increasing the amount of doles and simplifying the procedures of receiving an entitlement to uh, uh, unemployment benefits. There were several other measures to subsidize wages and salaries, which were very limited as compared to European countries, meaning one minimum uh, wage or mi one minimum salary was the extra benefit offered to, to people. There's something else we reiterated at various seminars. Well, families with children were offered various support measures uh, with due account of their need, status, or without this account. And as well as the improvement of unemployment benefits, during the first wave of the pandemic, there was so much discussion as to how much Russia spends on supporting the economy through fiscal measures, through direct benefits. However, if we take a look at where we stand in terms of our expenditures as regards the per capita GDP, then we see that as compared to developed countries, we're spending much less than they. However, in another bracket, in, amongst the countries with comparable amount of uh, level of economic development, Russia is somewhere in the middle. So uh, the Russian system of support measures is adequate to where it stands in economic terms. I'm not going to enumerate or to list all the measures offered to households. I'd rather say that there have been quite a few, uh, both on the regional level and the federal level. And those measures were different in terms of their availability, accessibility, and coverage of target groups. We will see that in Alena Pershniak's presentation that this uh, enabled households to actually learn about new measures available to them, although the government tried to announce them. Uh, a lot of households learn something new about that. Being part of the business community or just households, there are so many different support measures uh, uh, that were linked to increased coverage and simplified access procedures to benefits or inclusion in various social programs. They were associated with um, tax holidays and income tax holidays for in particular, or credit holidays and direct support measures were targeted at families with children mainly, and they were 
either one-off or very short term. As regards to the introduction um, speed, when it comes to unemployment benefits and sick leave payments, those were introduced as part of the first package. They started, they, they came into effect during the very early stage in the first wave of the pandemic. However, when it comes to families with children, they were introduced a little later. Unlike those that were that that had been introduced even before the pandemic, it is essential to emphasize that most of the support measures were focused mainly on the first wave of the pandemic. By the beginning of the second wave, September October of this year, almost all measures of direct cash transfers and cash disbursement. Uh, were not available. They had been terminated before that. When it comes to those employees that were subject to increased risk of contagion, those that were employed by socially important occupations, medical workers first and foremost, and social care workers, amongst them, the bulk of support was placed on the first wave and medical workers receive their first benefits quite quickly. Now, while well, people are procrastinating with the second package of support, mainly they received most of the help, most of support during the first wave. Well, the new plan adopted in September of this year includes a number of measures, but they do not increase any, any actual cash transfers. Those had been made before that. When we take a look at the federal support measures, we shall see that they are mainly focused with people who are subject to increased occupational risks of contagion and support of the living standards of those people who have suffered a deterioration of their living standards, loss of income. It was the level of living standards, not the quality of living. The amount of that support was very modest. And I would also like to note the time lag of the availability of those measures, like um, sole proprietors and uh, self-employed people. And also, social measures were mainly focused on the traditional measures of the poverty target group, poor people. Uh, other measures were introduced and exercised indirectly and through other tools of business support in those sectors that were affected the most by the pandemic. What is important here? Uh, legal sector. The legal sector was subject, even if you applied for an unemployment benefit, you first have to prove that you're formally registered unemployed, not just working in the informal sector. Uh, well, this doesn't make Russia very different from European countries, but it does make it different from other countries of similar economic level or stage of economic development when informal employment is widespread. And some other countries decided to improve and increase the coverage uh, of the tar tar target audience amongst the informal sector. Almost all those measures were short-lived and many of them were one-off measures. And today there are no new measures available or uh, offered to the people despite the second wave of the pandemic. One can say that the government thus discontinues the national regime of those lockdown. However, various regions are introducing some restrictions 
and limitations on economic activities. And those restrictions are in place and they do affect the business well-being and risk of unemployment or reduction in the income level. When it comes to regional measures, most of the decisions were made made as a follow-up to federal support measures. However, there were some decisions that expanded the federal mandate, and they mainly concerned people who lost their income. Uh, regions offered unorthodox approaches, creative approaches to them to supplement federal benefits. People who were not officially fired, but who still lost their income due to idle time, and so many others. Uh, they continued and uh, followed up on the federal mandate on support to families with children through in-kind assistance, through meal kits and uh, meal packages for uh, uh, people, for children and for families, for their parents. Unlike federal measures, regions offered support to senior citizens. There are not quite many of them, but still they offered meals, they offered some foodstuffs and free access to mobile communications or the internet. It is also important to mention that they offer them at-home services through volunteers or social workers. Social assistance and social services from relatives or social workers were very much in place. Several other uh, decisions were made to improve social assistance to medical workers. I would like to emphasize uh, the fact that regions try to focus on more than the living standards, but the quality of living, and they wanted to mitigate the risks of the pandemic that were not properly covered by the federal package. We should also note that the actual amount of the support was very limited. We can see that uh, if we if we look at the coverage of the target groups, we shall see that decisions in support of senior citizens were made by those regions that were mainly populated by younger people, meaning that the actual size of the target group was very limited. It was smaller than elsewhere or there are regions that were mostly affected by the first wave of the pandemic. And the intention of the regional government was to support senior people uh, so that they could comply with this self-isolation requirement. And taking a similar question by Sergei Nikolaevich, um, he asked Hugo, so what, what was the effect of those measures? Let me give you a few estimates from two sources. Estimates from my colleagues from the Living Studies Laboratory and the Institute at the Vnesh Econom Bank. And the VEB believes that Without the support measures, the unemployment levels could have been 1% more and disposable incomes could have fallen by 7 8% as compared to the available Rostat figures. When it comes to families with children, yes, due to the limited amount of support, the level of standards of the families with children remain somewhat higher. And the best effect falls within the group on the families with children aged three to seven. At the previous workshop, Daria Popova said that disposable income was different when it comes to with families with two children or families with three or more children. 
uh, overall, the poverty level was reduced by 3.2 percent. So the positive effect is there. It is very much in evidence and it can be measured through consumer expenses and consumer demand. What else? What are the open questions? Almost all countries believed that the first wave of the pandemic was a temporary force majeure situation which we have to live through and then we'll get back to the life we lived before and then we'll get back to our previous traditional lifestyles and so the, this is why they place an emphasis on existing social programs but the federal government and regional governments placed most emphasis on the existing social groups or those target social groups that were easily identifiable and uh, various approaches proved their efficiency especially when they could be scalable however having said that we see that there is a second wave of the pandemic uh, we are in the middle of and the third way is already forecasted and we do not know for how long the pandemic will go on and how many waves were in for and for how long this lockdown periods will mitigated or e e increased will continue So I would like to stress that um, proceeding from the institutional theory, the insti new institutions are established when we are confident that the circumstances will keep on and recur again. Now, epidemiologists say that we need to get used to living amidst the pandemic. Uh, so the aging of the population a change in the marital matrimonial practices of people and the fluctuations of the wages will be supplemented by a new factor, which is the pandemic. The pandemic does not mitigate or abolish those challenges. It aggravates the existing challenges and it also introduces a new one, the factor of uncertainty. So the and it introduces new vulnerable groups. Everything which is related to the services sector becoming vulnerable to the pandemic. I believe that from the perspective of social protection, the response to the first wave of the pandemic was adequate to the challenge. Uh, we supported consumer demand uh, in an appropriate way. Uh, the uh, focus was uh, somewhat shifted. Um, however, the support uh, to families with children were adequate and business community also received uh, assistance. What was not done is the following. There was no support to those people who had informal employment. And uh, also it seemed like the families with children that studied remotely uh, were not paid much attention to. Now we are looking at the situation against the backdrop of the second wave of the pandemic. We see that there is no recovery in employment. The uh, incomes are not recovering either. This uh, looks like an unstable situation, uh, like in the field of uh, consumer consumption as well. We need to build social policies, assuming that we will see a transformation in employment. We will see uncertainty, instability associated with the pandemic. So, uh, I will agree with what uh, Ugo said uh, in his conclusions. Uh, institutional programs can be very effective and we need to develop new forms of employment 
platform-based, remote work-based. There's got to be a better balance between life and work. And the final thing I want to say is that we need to refer to many countries experience, see what uh, different uh, countries did in social investment, how people scheduled uh, childcare holidays, what uh, different uh, countries did about uh, sick leave situations, what can be done in the way of transition to remote uh, learning mechanisms. Uh, this would really improve the situation for very many with children. That would improve the quality of life. That would also improve the level of productivity of people that have families with Thank you very much, Oksana, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am going to launch my PowerPoint presentation now. I hope you can see it well. I am going to continue to talk about the social support during COVID-19 pandemic, and I will talk about the reaction of society. Uh, please bear in mind uh, that uh, we are not going to talk about uh, expert assessments. Uh, that is something that was addressed in the first part of the presentation. Now we are going to look at the situation through the eyes of Russian citizens. I am going to refer to facts uh, that her School of Economics collected this year. There's been two uh, serious surveys that are quite representative. We also worked with focus groups. The data is very fresh. And I'm going to talk about the attitude uh, to the authorities' response measures, uh, the level of awareness, uh, and uh, some criticism about measures during the pandemic. Of course, I have to uh, start by saying how people see changes in the quality of their lives at the time of this uh, coronavirus shock. Uh, according to many people, uh, the uh, situation has deteriorated very seriously. More than uh, one third of the respondents said that, to be more precise, 35%. It's very interesting to look at the risk factors that people have identified uh, it uh, includes a loss of job and uh, shrinking incomes. And there's also an issue of security. There's a whole range of security factors. When we look at risk factors, first of all, it's employment in the field of services. Uh, people know where they suffered more than in other areas. Those people who had a uh, gray employment that had no labor contracts were hit more than others. Those who were getting uh, paid uh, informally, they suffered more than others. They were also the first uh, to get fired. What is also very important uh, in this uh, context of the consequences of the pandemic uh, is what I have is my uh, third bullet. Whether the respondents were employees or self-employed people or unemployed, they would all say that uh, the self-employed were in a particularly difficult situation. Self-employed and individual entrepreneurs were hit more than anyone else. That was makes this crisis different uh, from other crises that Russia has experienced uh, in the past. Uh, people used to say that uh, the pensioners and uh, families with many children suffered more than others, but they never mentioned uh, self-employed citizens. It's very important uh, to have a legal work contract. When people got fired, they would say that they have received all due payments uh, that helped them 
uh, to survive during the lockdown, and they were doing fairly well uh, at the time of self-isolation. Those who work for big companies, especially uh, companies uh, that are state-owned, have not experienced any changes. Uh, they have not even switched to teleworking, and uh, the employees have not felt uh, any impact, uh, no reduction of wages or anything. It's interesting to look at the IT sector, where people had experience in working from home before the lockdown. Many of them said that they kept their income at the same level as before the pandemic. Some of them said that uh, their salaries have increased because the uh, counterparts that they worked with had uh, more tasks for them. They were receiving more orders and that happens quite quickly. Uh, we see that uh, many people have seen deterioration in the income level. We cannot say, though, that there was a serious uh, change in the structure of consumption. Well, of course, people were spending less on transport and on entertainment. Uh, many people spent less on uh, clothes and self-care, and uh, this made up for some expenses decreases. So some families have not felt a serious uh, impact. In this chart, there is yet another interesting piece of information. This new crisis is very different uh, from anything we have experienced in the past. Uh, we have looked at the subjective opinions of uh, people living in different areas. You can see that Moscow and big capital cities said that uh, their quality of life has deteriorated. More people in big cities said that. Of course, we have to be extra careful with those numbers. We have to realize that uh, there are specific risks in rural areas, we know that the income level in rural areas is lower than in cities. So probably they were not very high in the first place, so they had nowhere to fall. And uh, the limitations that were imposed on the rural areas were not as stringent as what we saw in the capital cities. But there are other interesting conclusions that we can draw from that. It uh, has to do with the different population groups that were targets of social assistance. Uh, rural areas are at social risk. So when the poor got support uh, from the government uh, that had uh, an impact on smaller towns and on people who live in rural areas. We see that uh, one fifth of the population uh, say that their situation has actually improved. Now I am going to uh, change gears and uh, talk about the attitude uh, towards the authorities' actions. Many people said uh, that in the most difficult uh, time, uh, which is not over yet, and many people uh, say that uh, they expect it to get worse. So people are not only looking back, they're also trying to look into the future, uh, trying to uh, see what is there for them. In general, uh, what those surveys tell us is that the population approves of the actions taken by the authorities in the context of fighting the consequences of the pandemic. Uh, but uh, we see some contradictions though, when we start talking about specific measures, 
we see this general approval of the uh, stimulus, uh, but specific measures were not always satisfactory. Very many people said uh, that uh, the government uh, talked more than it acted, and uh, various assistance measures were hardly accessible to most people, and uh, what the government did was not quite what people expected. Uh, most frequently, people would lay blame on the federal authorities. They often would say that uh, the authorities were not uh, decisive. They have failed uh, to declare the state of emergency. And when people talk about the state of emergency, they would usually assume that uh, all the rest to it, as uh, they would not have to make certain uh, payments, that they would all receive financial benefits, and that would be it. This is what very many people expected. And uh, when we talked to them about this, uh, people would refer to other countries uh, saying that uh, in other parts of the world governments would take such decisions and offer such financial assistance. Uh, many people expected the state of emergency to be uh, imposed and at the same time uh, people were outraged at the limitations like the introduction of travel passes and fines uh, that were leveled at those who violated uh, the limitations. Uh, some people said that uh, they were expecting to get uh, personal protection uh, equipment uh, from the government uh, for free. We see uh, that uh, very many of those things are consistent uh, with the a general vision of the economic challenges that uh, we are going to face in the future. What people fear today uh, is the following, loss of a job, uh, failure to receive pensions and uh, salaries. Uh, we see that uh, many risks have become more acute at the time of the pandemic. And uh, it's interesting to look at data of 2020 and compare this data to the uh, surveys of 2018. Uh, we uh, looked at, at people's readiness uh, for changes back then. Uh, so we have uh, the possibility to run this comparison. Here you can uh, see the distribution of answers regarding uh, social uh, assistance, where people agreed and where people disagreed. In 2020, we have seen a sharp increase in the number of the people who uh, assumed that the government should uh, provide a higher standard of living in difficult situation. Of course, we can see that uh, those people who have uh, felt uh, quite comfortable in the past now uh, face difficulties. In the past, they assumed that they could uh, cope with any situation on their own. Uh, today, many of them uh, started counting on the government. Uh, this is uh, quite an interesting development. Uh, they have changed their attitude uh, to this issue. Now, let us look at some actual steps that were taken at the time of the pandemic. I'm going to talk about awareness of different measures uh, that were launched by the government. Uh, I will also talk about the experience that people got uh, as they tried uh, to uh, use uh, certain benefits uh, from the government. I have highlighted uh, some of the measures that people were fully and broadly aware of and people tried uh, to get access to. All these measures 
have to do with uh, payments for children. Uh, we also see other types of assistance, uh, specifically uh, designated for nurses and doctors. We can see quite a lot of measures supporting self-employed small businesses. Uh, the population knew about those measures. However, uh, very many people said that they tried to apply uh, for such benefits but failed to receive them. It's important to understand this. Uh, if we want uh, to improve uh, the provision of such assistance in the future. This table does not give us an idea about the uh, level of those support measures and how widely spread they were and whether those measures were really relevant uh, to people's needs. The next chart uh, deals with that. First of all, I want to say that uh, nobody uh, said that, uh, well, very few people said that they do not need any government uh, support, uh, less than 30 uh, percent. And uh, quite a lot of people expect uh, to uh, have a fair pay and other things at the time of crisis. Uh, there are uh, specific problems that uh, people that had no formal employment uh, brought up. I understand that uh, there are two uh, charts here and they do not fully match each other. The questions that were asked were slightly different, but we can still draw some conclusions. Uh, when people expected uh, some assistance from the government, uh, we can see that on the left-hand side, more than 50% uh, of the people wanted that. And uh, about 60% uh, of the people received no benefits. And uh, the payments for children were received on the mass scale. And uh, that's where they are different uh, from most of other measures. This brings me almost to the end of my presentation. Something very important is the criticism of support measures uh, that were available at the time of the pandemic. You can see the measures which were not sufficient and you can see the list of measures that were poorly implemented. So what was lacking? Uh, the official quarantine was what people expected. People were expecting uh, that there will be uh, delayed uh, or canceled uh, payments. There would be uh, utility uh, payment uh, postponements or uh, cancellations, uh, also the uh, so-called helicopter money. Many people expected uh, to receive uh, assistance uh, in a monetary form that would help them to support their household needs. Uh, there have been different uh, estimates and expectations in terms of amounts, and the difference is uh, between eight and 20,000 rubles, uh, which is a big difference. Uh, repayment holidays is another uh, issue that many people brought up. Support for small and medium-sized businesses were not sufficient. Uh, getting uh, subsidies was very difficult and uh, there had uh, to be more uh, OCVAD uh, codes describing different types of activities that had to be covered 
by the support uh, packages. In this chart, I have uh, brought up three categories of uh, social assistance that uh, people liked uh, to talk about uh, quite emotionally. There was uh, quite a lot of criticism. We have seen that uh, the payments uh, for children uh, were quite welcome, but uh, we uh, also see that uh, this threshold of 16 years uh, seemed uh, to be unfair to many people. Uh, quite a lot of uh, families uh, support their children who are above 16 years as of the unemployment benefits uh, criticism there's uh, many people who said that it's uh, difficult uh, to get access to those funds there were delays uh, in registration in the employment offices uh, the payments were not always uh, carried out in due time and there was a lot of uh, debate about the amounts that were due because oftentimes the unemployment benefits were below 12,000 rubles and obviously people were unhappy about the inability to actually to pay their utility bills using that amount of money, those benefits, or provide decent meals for their families, for their households. And there's been a lot of uh, criticism about credit holidays. There were no holidays at all, people said. There were just a deferment of their the payments. And actually, if you have no revenues, if your income is very low, then you'll have no money to pay off your credits, even if it is deferred for some time. And those tax holidays were actually insufficient and inefficient. There's a general feeling that people were actually advised against this because banks made that procedure of those deferments and holidays very cumbersome. And on the record, they said that you should rather not do that. Also, those credit holidays becomes very acute because you need to prove that your income has fallen by 20% or more. And if you're working in the informal sector, you have no, no chance of doing that. And I wanna reiterate what I have said during my presentation, that the people's well-being has plummeted, has gone down substantially. More than 35% of families lost in their incomes. And apart from being employed in affected industries and sectors, uh, people, some of the most, were those that were working in informal sector and without any official employment, and small businesses suffered the worst in the eyes of the population. And paradoxically, overall, they think highly and positively of the government efforts. And still, when you go down into details, we hear a lot of criticism and that the pandemic actually aggravated mistrust of uh, powers that be. And uh, actual distrust of the public information. Well, there's a leveling out of uh, the threats and the danger of the coronavirus and mistrust of the official morbidity statistics. And the perception of people and state support was actually reduced to sheer rhetoric. In actual fact, it was very difficult to make use of the announced support measures. That inconsistency 
of government policies and especially by contrast to measures uh, introduced in other countries. A lot of groups were focused on what kind of support was offered to people in Europe and in the United States, whereas our country did not shell out uh, at all. I believe that the most effective in the other people were one of um, cash payments to families with children and there were no problem at all as regards to the actual accessibility when it came to other support measures they were hardly accessible people said and what is important for us is that they are, appear to be hard to find and hard to access thank you for your attention that's all i wanted to say Thank you. Thank you, Alina Igorevna and dear colleagues. Since we actually spent more time than we were given originally, it will, I would be very happy if those people who wanted to ask questions would actually drop uh, a line in the chat and we will take them from there. I would now like to get, open up the floor for discussion. And Yelena Grishina wanted to act as a, one of the discussant. And Yelena Grishina will be speaking for 10 minutes after that we'll take your questions and we'll still have another 10 minutes or so for q a so that we shall wrap it up by 7 15 or 7 20 at the latest so elena you can have now so the floor is yours thank you thank you colleagues thank you for inviting me to join in and for an opportunity to hear so many interesting presentations, I will be very brief in my remarks. First of all, I'd like to note that all presenters raised an important topic of the sufficiency of social support schemes, social support measures, both in Russia and elsewhere in the world. And, in, and uh, how did Russian uh, support social policies look as compared to other countries and whether all social strata were covered by social support and social assistance. And it so happened that some of the social groups were outside of this umbrella. They were either not covered at all or they were entitled to very limited help and amongst the social groups that were mentioned are informal uh, sector workers and those employees that lost in their income, although they were not formally unemployed. We should also mention amongst the vulnerable groups that were needed that, that, that were in need of hope are those families that had no children because most support uh, policies were focused on families with children uh, or those uh, or, or seven, whereas people which were nearing their uh, retirement or over 50 years of age that were subject to substantial risk of income reduction and equally young people who had no children at all. They were all amongst the vulnerable groups. Uh, we had several polls amongst the population, which indicate that back in May, 38% of respondents said that they assessed government measures as sufficient. By early December, only 26% of respondents said so. So we can see that people's attitude to government efforts deteriorated over time, whereas the requirement, the need for help remained high. 
starting from the month of May, because the income situation is not getting better at all. Therefore, it is essential to keep on with our ongoing discussion to identify what specifically actually made some people not covered by social assistance and support and what specific factors uh, actually affected that. I would venture to say that we may have some insufficient support tools. Say the pandemic illuminated and highlighted those issues that were hidden, had been hidden before. We have no effective tools of identifying the needy people if they're not amongst direct applicants. And that concerns both the individuals and their family members so that help could be provided without requiring piles and piles of paperwork and that people could apply for help online. Unfortunately, this is something that we do not have available. In addition to that, we identified several other problems and drawbacks. So the food bags were handed out in many regions and some sponsors joined in that effort, volunteers joined in that effort amongst others. However, there's no integrated system, nationwide system, that would offer equal opportunities to people, including senior people, in terms of that food aid or social services with equal access at various reach in various regions. I'm afraid we do not have that system in place at the time. And those bottlenecks were known before the pandemic. However, the pandemic highlighted the need to rectify the situation and that we are badly in need of a system of social support and social care. And this is something that could have made our support efforts far more efficient. In this connection, I have a question to our keynote speakers. Look, you mentioned about the informal sector, people who lost in their income. that they were uh, given cash and uh, they had no labor contracts officially and we could not offer them support just because we do not have any reliable tools or instruments to, to channel our cash transfers to is because we, we would not have a, an accurately targeted system. We normally provided aid via employers as loans or as credits that were very difficult to uh, obtain even by employers. So all support measures were not targeted at individuals, they were targeted at companies and employers. This is an equally acute challenge now. From your perspective, what what could have been done differently to actually to cover those individuals making use of the international experience? This is an outstanding challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yelena, for interesting, most interesting comment. Um, colleagues, I believe that you could now either ask your questions via the chat or raise your hand. And you can actually virtually raise your hand in this uh, online session. 
I would now like to take those questions that were uh, in the chat. The first one, Yelena Gorena drew my attention. The fact that the president today promised one-off uh, cash transfers to every child under seven years old in the country today during his press conference. Uh, well, so my immediate response is that we're talking about one-off um, uh, payments transfers again, one-off, and only to children under seven years old, meaning that we're offering different uh, terms uh, for, for the children of different age. So I do not think that this is a systemic response from the from, from, from the country, from the government. There was another question about from Dmitry Bichkov. I mentioned the low level of direct support efforts, whereas it's the amount of support as GDP share was more or less okay, and that we may reduce uh, the poverty level even more from to il to 11.6% as compared to the pre-pandemic 12.6%. So, why the result? I believe that we need to look into the World Bank model, the its modeling exercise. Every modeling exercise will be very sensitive to the actual inputs. So what I said, based on our survey of the living standards um, e assessment center and how the social support measures affected the pandemic and the living standards. I believe that the poverty level of families with children was still a tiny bit more than it could have been. And those were very short lived measures uh, by, the, by the by. So I do not, I'm not very optimistic at the moment. So Alena, would you like to, to add something to, to my remarks? Yes, please. Yes, yes. Oh, overall, I fully agree that all assessments should be looked at against the background of the methodologies underlying them. If we take a look at the measurements taken within a given month, and if we consider all payments within this given month, that 10,000 rubles in benefits would actually bring out a lot of families with children out of the poverty chains. And still, we also need to to, to, to actually to look at how big are those cash transfers in terms of their annual income, and then assessments will change dramatically. I, 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 I'm not sure, though, that this is a source of our differences with the World Bank. I believe that we need to talk about that even more, to discuss this more. I believe that the effect is much less than that. Yes, this is a topic for another workshop. Mr. Smirnov, I I'm sorry, my camera isn't working. Look, we are living under COVID in Russia. We have been living under COVID for nine plus months. And I would like to thank all presenters. Those were very interesting presentations, truly interesting presentations indeed. And still, I wanted to ask several questions. Uh, would you agree with the following statement? In April, when we had a strong lockdown imposed on the country, we assumed that this was the government taking care of the people who were not adequately protected. Now, uh, these measures for different groups of population are taken in a different way. I'm not talking about 
uh, social assistance. I'm uh, talking about economic interest. Uh, and uh, I'm talking about uh, the level of uh, health. Uh, I am looking at various demographic parameters and I have this uh, interesting feeling. Uh, my uh, second question has to do with what Alina said. Uh, I I don't understand. On the one hand, people want to have a state of emergency. On the other hand, uh, they are unhappy when they are not allowed uh, to walk around or drive their car without a pass. Uh, this is a, a strange uh, mismatch. Uh, people were put in a new uh, situation which they found strange. Uh, you probably know how much I'm interested in these matters, therefore I am speaking about all these things. I uh, quite agree with uh, uh, the following. In September and in August, uh, the situation was uh, getting better. And uh, if you have done your uh, survey at that time, uh, then uh, the responses uh, would be more favorable and there would be fewer people who disapprove. And one more comment, if I may, Ms. Pishnak, the uh, chart uh, that you uh, demonstrated that uh, showed the uh, level of uh, distribution of various assistance measures, uh, how widespread they were. I think uh, it would be interesting to look at uh, how many people have actually received uh, that uh, stimulus out of those who were eligible. It would be interesting to see how many people uh, had uh, repayment holidays on their loans. We would like to see the percentage of those who actually received those benefits uh, compared to all the people who were eligible for such uh, measures. That would be very interesting. Uh, if I may, I would like to quickly comment on that. Uh, we did our survey in September and in October. In October, the number of the new cases uh, increased seriously and we had new limitations imposed on residents. Uh, we would appreciate uh, your inputs and we would uh, like to think about other aspects, but I think we generally uh, understand uh, how many people have loans, at least 50% of the population have uh, various types of loans. And when we see uh, that there's only 1% uh, who received uh, those repayment holidays, we know what that tells us. Uh, we don't even need to do a specific research on that matter. We can assume uh, that this uh, offering did not reach all the people that it was designed to help. Thank you, Alina. Uh, Sergey, uh, I want to ask a clarification question. I understand your first question was addressed to me, but I did not quite understand what you wanted me to explain. At first, I thought that you talked about the first wave and uh, it looked like the government was trying to uh, offer assistance to the least protected uh, groups of population. And uh, then you said that the government had its own agenda. I misunderstood. What, what, what did you try to say? Something that we cannot see. Sergey? I will try to respond to what I assume your question was. I think that in general, during the first wave, we responded by the book. 
we looked at uh, the best international practices. Many countries entered the first wave of the pandemic before we did. So we looked at what other people did. We also saw what uh, different nations did at the time of economic crisis in 2008. Uh, social policy is counter-cyclic and uh, it's an important part of economic policy. There was an assumption that this pandemic would not take long, it would be a short crisis. When the government realized that the pandemic would be uh, long, that changed the attitude and uh, they changed their minds about what is going to be useful uh, for the population and what would be good uh, to keep up people's incomes. So the government decided to postpone uh, extra limitations uh, to keep various uh, sectors of the economy from shutting down. And that became a priority in the second wave of the pandemic as of the impact on the income. Well, uh, some people assume that people's incomes come from employment. We're talking about labor income. So we can easily understand the logic of government uh, policies. We actually understand the importance of social assistance for the dynamic of economic performance. I believe that is what happened. It would be short-sighted understand uh, what uh, matters for the budget in the next two years, but we also understand the strategic needs and challenges. We need to uh, support consumption. We need to uh, create incentives for a greater demand amongst different groups of population. People continue to work, uh, people get sick, and uh, people are unhappy because they feel they are abandoned in some way. There's another question that we received in the chat. Uh, to what extent social assistance in Russia is in line with general patterns? Have we seen any unexpected uh, non-traditional measures? Uh, let me tell you this. Uh, we cannot make any comments about the uh, change of the government. We don't think that this is something we can expect. I think uh, that uh, there were two sides of response to the crisis. Our economy uh, has suffered dropping oil prices in March. Whether or not uh, the measures are in line with the uh, traditional patterns, I think that uh, most of the policies were based on the existing social assistance uh, programs. We just faced a new challenge. It was like a force majeure situation, but the government still relied on the traditional institutions. We have seen some new initiatives at regional level, and uh, there's been uh, some new things introduced at the federal level, uh, mostly in the way of uh, digital technologies uh, use in new ways. This is something that we talked about in the previous workshop. In the previous crisis in 2008-2009, we have seen a support offered uh, to those groups that did not suffer the most. At that time, support was offered to the retired people, to pensioners. That's uh, because there have been uh, quite a lot of problems uh, with the uh, standards of living of the retired people. And uh, there were a lot of 
steps taken before the crisis struck. Now we see uh, support uh, offered uh, to families with children. Uh, they are in the focal point uh, of government measures, but not those uh, who were uh, hit mostly in the economic way. Uh, we see that there is traditional support uh, to the poor. Maybe Alina wants to add something to this. I agree that uh, most decisions were quite traditional. They were targeting the groups of population that were at risk. In my presentation, I actually said that uh, we have seen some interesting outcomes uh, some groups have come out of poverty due to the uh, social assistance measures. Many measures focused on the people that were not experiencing the greatest risk, not those who were hit the most. Traditionally, uh, there are some poorer social groups, families with children, and they were targeted uh, during this launch of stimulus package. Maybe Ugo can respond uh, to the question that was raised. It was a question about different examples of offering people who do not have formal employment, uh, who are getting paid in cash without a labor contract. What has been done in other parts of the world, in Russia, there was no assistance offered to such people. Ugo, would you? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And uh, um, I have to say, this has been a, an incredible journey. I've really enjoyed the deep dive uh, into the Russian experience. And I think there is uh, a whole range of issues that uh, are very much in sync uh, with uh, what's happening elsewhere. Um, I, I heard issues around uh, structural issues around whether the social protection system is uh, adequate to start with, issues around fairness, uh, um, around how to reach particular profiles and indeed informal sector workers, um, issues around uh, simplified administration. I think these are um, all um, all uh, uh, issues that are emerging uh, in other countries. And uh, uh, I think the underlying question on how much of this experience uh, gonna become uh, permanent is something that animates uh, debates across countries so it, it was really fascinating to hear uh, the russian perspective on it on on the particular issue of informal sector workers well I first of all i would uh, highlight another aspect as well even among formal sector workers workers that have non-standard employment contracts that also was uh, was quite a um a challenge in a number of cases of uh, um, what comes to mind is uh, uh, city-level examples like Berlin, that uh, uh, Berlin gave uh, quite a generous amount of uh, um, cash, uh, was about uh, $5,000 uh, uh, to artists, uh, freelancers, and, and other formal workers with non-startup employment uh, contracts. I think the OECD also has done a terrific publication on, on this topic, but going to more than formal uh, workers, I, I fully agree uh, with those that, uh, I think it was Alina who, who said that those were the ones who suffered uh, the most in many cases and the first to lose their jobs. Um, and um, uh, there, uh, you know, in the, in the number of uh, the experience is quite diverse, whether you look at low or, or higher income countries. Uh, for the lower end of the spectrum, uh, informality is a norm. Um, and where you have 80% of the workforce that is informal, that is uh, pretty much uh, uh, a, a, um, a structural issue. And um, uh, we're about to release a paper on how that was done in a range of uh, 
uh, countries, uh, countries in Africa, for instance, where um, I think there was uh, uh, one challenge um, was not only you know informal sector workers, but also informal settlements, uh, uh, housing that uh, weren't really on the master plan, and uh, uh, and that uh, uh, structures that come and go. Um, so all the issue on how you work in slums. Uh, I think is also quite significant. So not only informality in employment, but informality in settlements and housing is, is a big issue. Um, just to give one, uh, one example that, that uh, comes to mind with uh, uh, some of those contexts, uh, one of the first countries that, uh, that acted was, uh, was Sierra Leone and, uh, and they had, um, and they worked uh, very closely with uh, an array of non-traditional partners uh, like trade association, associations, um, like um, uh, a civil society um, and uh, very local level organizations uh, that were able uh, to come up with uh, lists of uh, uh, workers that uh, uh, are informal but weren't really in any of the government databases. And then there was a whole process of trying of connecting, connecting the two. Um, and, uh, but there is, uh, and Nigeria has done, uh, has, has undergone a similar process, but there is an underlying also, I think challenge of, uh, uh, or a trade-off between speed, how fast you can act and accuracy in data, um, how, accurate that uh, that data is and i think the moment that this uh interventions are, are gonna if they begun gonna become more permanent there is quite an agenda in um in ensuring that uh, um or informal sector workers are actually part of the databases of of governments um uh, but there is also another another point that uh, cash transfers or a point of contact. They're a point of contact between the state and um, informal workers that often haven't really engaged with, with the state in significant ways in a number of these contexts. So the question is, what's next? And we already see a number of places. Uh, Pakistan is one example. India is another where the provision of cash was leveraged to provide something else. So um, set up of um, uh, saving accounts, uh, social inclusion. Um, there is something about social assistance that is very concrete and direct in the way it, um, it provides supports. It's a really direct point of contact, but then one could use and leverage that to um, uh, provide multiple services and additional support. And that's exactly what we're, we're seeing now. Um, uh, which call for more integrated approaches. Uh, and the fine line there is to keep building on those, uh, on those services, but not making overly complex as well, in, especially in cases where administrative capacity is, is quite low. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very sorry to say that we have to bring this uh, workshop to a close. Я бы развернул еще на другие 30-40 минут, но у всех есть время и время работать. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up our discussion. Well, I would like so much to um, uh, extend our discussion by another 30-40 minutes, but. There's still family time. We need to spend time with our families too. I'd like to thank you all. I would like to thank you all for most interesting comments. I want to thank Ugo for his extremely exciting presentation and his in-depth comments to the questions we asked him, which facilitate a better understanding of the overall picture. If Uga or Alina wanted to say something, you have not more than one minute, or we shall call it a day. I only wanted to thank all the, the audience for their interesting questions, for their involvement, and I wanted to thank the organizers for, 
giving, giving me a chance to, to present my work. Thank you. Hugo, did you want to say something? Oh, Thank you so yes? much uh, uh, to the Higher School of Economics. I did, it was extremely fascinating for me. I learned a lot. I hope I gave something back. Um, so really, really thank you so much. Uh, you can always contact me anytime, uh, an open channel. Um, and uh, I also like to really thank the interpreters <laughs> who did a fabulous, uh, fabulous job, uh, both in translating my, my presentation, but also in, with interpretations throughout the, the event. Thank you so much. Thank you indeed. I wanted to thank the World Bank for our regular ongoing cooperation. I wanted to thank Olga Voran for being the organizer and interpreters who had a hard time during the discussion. Uh, colleagues, I believe that the COVID agenda is not exhausted by far. And we have a very ample agenda on um, our on our topics at hand on our active aging policy. So we would be happy to see you at future workshops next year, 2021. That will probably begin uh, by making use of the online platform, Zoom platform. Anyway, this is still an opportunity of uh, luring the best experts in our, in our workshops. So thank you so much. Thank you, discussants. Thank you, Elena Grishina. And all presentations will be posted on the HSC um, web page. And we shall also post the video footage of this workshop. Those who are our fans and followers on Facebook will also have a chance of uh, revisiting this. So, so Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, goodbye.